Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Linner, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Tiffany Farag. Tiffany Farag, a daughter of Egyptian parents, was born and raised in Victoria, Australia. After devoting herself and completing a number of degrees in the medical science field, she became a doctor. Her patients attest to her impeccable skill of actively hearing others. Tiffany is now an emerging thought leadership podcast extraordinaire. Welcome to the podcast, Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. So glad to be here. Yes, yes. And it's nice to have someone in the medical field, me being in the medical field, because we like to talk about these things. So, <laughs> so fun to have you on. And you have kind of spread out, not way past the medical field into the emotional healing field and um, all, all sorts of directions. So just so people can get to know you, why don't you tell us your story? I mean, you started out, you know, Egyptian and Australian. I know you're in Spain now. So tell us about you. So, yes, I, uh, my parents are both Egyptian. My uh, grandfather immigrated to Australia in 1971 and uh, he, with his five boys and his wife and typical story with $30 in his pocket and he went from there. And I guess a lot of opportunities came from that for myself and my siblings. And so, yeah, I went down the typical route of traditional, you know, getting, trying to get good grades and, and then going into the medical kind of field and did one degree and then did another and then did another and, and started working in that myself for a few years. And I decided uh, this is not all I wanted. And I wanted to experience other things, live in other countries. And uh, in 2017, I decided to move to Spain and take on a different type of work. Uh, in doing that to allow myself the really kind of like an adult gap here to really kind of narrow in on what it is I truly want to be doing because I started as I was in the as I am a doctor of the feet I started kind of having a more of an interest and started working in more of the you know emotional intelligence and personal development and just mental health and really had a strong interest for human behavior and thinking and I started reading journal article after journal article, all these books and, and so on. And so I was clear on that I wanted to work with people and kind of better our human experience and, and develop our certain things that we could um, uh, enhance within ourselves and on a global scale. So I wanted this freedom to really you know, take the time to myself and see I need some direction as to, well, this is what I want to do, but how do I want to get there? And a big part of that for me, I think, is meaningful conversation and being able to do this with yourself and others. And, and you know, as you meet new people from around the world, different backgrounds, environments, races, religions, and so on, and you connect on a deeper level, uh, it enhances your creative thinking and you're able to maybe collaborate together, work on projects and uh, come up with new ideas. And so I started my own podcast and it's been had the most amazing experience I've had in my life, I have to say, you know, and uh, I just love meeting like-minded people and people who are driven to better themselves and others, and they want to make an impact in the world. And yeah, that brings me, brings me here. And, and it's been, it's been amazing. Right. And you do have your own podcast too, so that you can continue these conversations with people. That's it. So. That's right. I do. So yeah, so let's just back up for a minute. So your grandfather came from Egypt to Australia and then your parents are both Egyptian. So yes. somehow two Egyptian people found each other because is, is Australia just multicultured like the United States? It where is. you can kind of find everyone? <laughs> it is, but actually my father didn't meet my mother in, in Australia. So what happened was my uh, my third uncle or the second oldest uncle was going to get married in Egypt and my father and his he's the youngest so the, the the second youngest brother were like okay well we haven't been back to Egypt since so well, let's go on a holiday so mm -hmm. they went on a holiday back to Egypt and my mother was actually engaged to somebody else but then broke it off like a week later and then friends of family friends of friends of friends everybody's at a house he sees my mother and they kind of hit it off there <laughs> it was all wow. kind of yeah. Wow. And then he had to actually talk her into moving to Australia away from her family. 
Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but my mother, luckily, uh, my mother's side of the family, they re- they had been traveling to and from eat, to and from the US. So they, my, my mother traveled to the US a lot. And something she did tell me, she's like, I always knew I would never live in Egypt. I'm like, oh, okay. But she's like, I didn't think of Australia either. I'm like, oh, but your father came along. I'm like, okay, well, that's okay. great. That's how that happened. That's how All that right. happened. Yeah. And then you started out taking care of people's feet as a podiatrist. So let's talk a little bit about that because I know you're very interested in what you're doing now, but there's a lot of people with a lot of feet problems. And I was actually telling you about some, you know, my, my uh, son and daughter were having working where they're working, where they have to be on their feet. So um, let's just talk about how do we take care of our feet? so that we don't start having pain because we don't really pay attention to them until they start hurting. That's exactly right. And um, at the moment, the podiatry kind of profession is still such a baby kind of profession. It's not like medical, uh, like dentistry, for example, and and, uh, other specialties. So the biggest thing, what I was telling you earlier, is that most shoes, unfortunately, are not made for our feet they're not uh, unfortunately that's that, that's not the case and so when i go into a shoe store i will sit there analyzing a shoe and bending it a bit seeing how it flexes seeing what that what it's made out of seeing the thickness of the sole i will sit there and analyze a shoe and i will be quite critical of that and i think we need to all do that i know our, our footwear is chosen based on our what we're wearing and, and things like that. But if you're wearing a shoe all day, a big thing that I find with my patients is that most people are wearing the wrong size shoe. They're wearing a size too small. But people also forget is if you're wearing something all day, what happens to your foot at the end of the day? Well, it swells up. Yeah. It swells up. So yeah. they, forget, they forget to take that part into consideration. So when you're wearing something that's too tight, you're going to have some problems. So already, so always make sure a big thing is that from the tip of your longest toe to the end of the shoe, you want a finger space in front of that. And that actually makes a lot of difference in, in preventing a lot of pain and a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing too, is if you know that there's some uh, hereditary things in the family, like pest planes, like flat feet and things like that, if you want to address those things or you're running differently or, or you've got some problems in your back, see, some people don't realize is that I also alter problems in the back, in the neck. So if you've got some of these higher problems, a lot of the time uh, people think I have to go see a chiro, I have to see a physio, I have to see these people on a regular weekly basis. But also there are many who can't. We all don't have our pockets aren't quite full for a lot of us. So it's mm-hmm. important to know that you have the ability to have these problems addressed and not have to have the frequent visits to the podiatrist or to any other health professional by Mm. actually having your feet and the way you walk analyzed and properly assessed so so be sure to recognize that if you do have lower back problems or neck problems and things like that and you've had you have seen physios and chiros and you haven't had the problem addressed you can also see a podiatrist who can alter and make devices for your for the way you walk to alter your whole body's, the way the, the uh, weight is distributed. Mm. Okay, so they would see a pod- podiatrist for that. They would analyze the way they walk and figure out which kind of shoes they need. Exactly, which kind of shoes, which devices is needed to make because, as I said, 99% of shoes aren't great for the feet. So you'd need a device that could go into most of your shoes. And then you take that in and out of a lot of a lot of different footwear. Another big thing, as I was talking about, our body isn't really symmetrical. There's one arm that's slightly longer. There's one eye that's slightly coming out a little bit more. One ear that sits a bit higher. So also one leg that's a little bit longer. Now that one centimeter or even half a centimeter makes a big difference in aches and pains in the knees and joints and so on. So if you have, we call this a limb length discrepancy. So if that is altered and you're back into both sides are equal, um, that will distribute your weight differently and change and change that. It could be as much as if you were to get two scales and mm-hmm. step one foot on one scale and one on another, if your weight, you'll notice that if one leg is slightly longer, the weight's not even equally distributed. You could have five kilos more on one leg just by with a half a centimeter 
quite oh, different. Wow, that's amazing distinction. Wow. Yes, but it's significant, significant difference and an impact on the body. Yeah, and, and also before we got on, you were telling me about a, a shoe that, um, you know, if someone's not going to get inserts right away, there was a shoe that you said that you tell a lot of your patients to get. You want to share that? Yes, I do. So the, the footwear that I recommend is Hoka, H-O-K-A. So there's a lot of what I like about this company. And there's another one actually that I didn't mention too called Ultra. What I like about these two and companies how do you spell is that one? A A L T R A Ultra. Ultra. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what I like about these companies is they, they were working with engineers. So there's a team of different types of people to properly engineer uh the footwear to as mm. as you know we're not humans aren't really built to run we're not meant to be running because it doesn't distribute it kind of bows our legs when we're running mm. so these footwears take that into consideration and prevent that such bowing so we can't injure ourselves mm -hmm. okay well that's really helpful because like i said i know a lot of people who have either feet problems or they have back problems and they don't realize it's their shoes causing it because I, I knew someone else that um, back problem, back problem, back problem, but he wore the same pair of shoes every day. He got mm. new shoes and guess what? His back problems went away. Exactly, exactly. And it makes a huge difference. You'll notice that if you just turn your feet, shoes over, you'll see where it's worn out. A lot of the time it's on the lateral side or the medial side. You're like, oh, and that, that on its own, it makes a huge difference in, in the pains and the body's uh, problems and remember too the different types of surfaces you're working on if you're someone who's working on concrete all day mm -hmm. that's going to impact you and impact uh, how much pounding you're doing on the solid ground if you're mm -hmm. working on grass and it's softer ground again that makes a big difference mm -hmm. yeah and um i ha i also found that um so in the past i always had to have i could never wear like a what we call a flip-flop or a flat shoe because it bothered my foot and so I always had like a flip flop with just a, like a little bit of a wedge, but then I actually worked myself into these shoes that were meant for flat running. You've seen those shoes. They're just, uh, they're just, the sole is actually flat. And so I, wor I worked myself into those and now I wear those very, very comfortably almost every day. But is it better to have a little bit of lift on your shoe or is it better for it to be a more flat shoe? You'd want a little bit of arch support. That's mm. where it's important. You need to have, because you're naturally your foot sits with a slight arch. So you want to support that arch. Mm -hmm. But everybody's so, arches are different, right? And that's, that's why. That's very true. That's no, exactly. And like I said, the footwear so, so uh, aren't particularly made for our feet. Well, I know they're made for our feet, but they're not really great for our feet so that's when like if you need some some custom-made orthotics and there's different types of custom-made orthotics too so people think oh i have to fork out an arm and a leg to be able to buy these things but not necessarily depending on the material that the orthotic is made from got it and is it possible to actually wear a heel or a wedge or anything you know something us women want to wear when we go out like i'm going to a women's networking meeting this evening um, and I'm short. <laughs> I'm like five one, <laughs> so I don't want to go with a flat shoe because then I really <laughs> look tiny, you know. So, <laughs> can we comfortably wear a shoe? Because the way I do it is I wear my flat shoe in the car. I put my heel on. I go on and do my thing for two hours, and then I take that off and put my flat shoe back on. <laughs> that is perfect. That's exactly right. If you're most of the day, most of the week, you're in a good supportive shoe, then when you do go out on a Saturday night and you've got a, and, and you want to dress up and you've got a, you know, cocktail dress kind of evening, that's great. And as long as that's not your, you know, your main footwear all throughout the week. Mm -hmm. So an hour or two, that's it. Perfect. Exactly what you're doing is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me, have you seen that movie? She, um, I, what is it called? She loves Prada, something like that. Devil wears Prada. The, the devil wears Prada. Yes. And she expects everyone to wear these really high heels that work <laughs> all day long and they all have their shoes under their desk. And as soon as she yes. hits the door, they say, <laughs> she's here and everybody gets their stilettos on. 
<laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That, that, mate, the other thing comes to my mind is I remember going to, when I did my first degree to university, we'd stop at Melbourne Central Station. But before that, there was a stop at Parliament Station. And all these uh, women who were in like, uh, you know, kind of suit attire, like all, uh, were wearing, running with heels. And everyone's so quick in the morning. Everybody's running in heels. And I was just amazed at like, whoa, there's a lot of problems that's going to arise from that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, well, thank you for explaining those things. Cause I think oh. a lot of people have those issues. So, so thank you. So, so you were doing podiatry in Australia, but then you said, you know, I'm really interested in these other things. And you started, you know, and you work with people every day, obviously, but you were getting more and more interested into more personal development and to, you know, people's, um, energy and how they're feeling and their relationships with other people. So how did that actually happen? Were you just working on that on your own and then you just got more and more interested in it, into it or? Yeah, I think it really started with myself and I was analyzing my own relationships with people. And, uh, and I would say I'm, you know, able to connect like make friends quite easily when i was younger i was able to make friends no problems it wasn't about that um and I, my personality type would be considered extroverted but uh it was more a matter of wanting to understand more like why why i was saying something in a certain way but yet it was taken in such a different way and i'm like what, what was going on here mm -hmm. and i guess working with my patients a lot of the time you know as you know where even though we're, I'm treating the feet and the problems in the back and, and the body itself, we're also talking, not necessarily, mm -hmm. not the whole time. If I'm doing a procedure, I don't need to be talking about the, the issue itself the whole time. The patient could be with me for half an hour to an hour. So we're getting to know people. Mm -hmm. And where um, there's, there's a lot of a like counseling or psychological aspect to it also. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, although there was a lot of satisfaction for uh, solving a problem and removing someone's pain, which I love removing mm -hmm. people's pain, and, and that was very satisfying, but there was also a big draw for me to want to that what was going on in the mind, what was happening on, on that kind of level. And just, mm -hmm. you know, relative to the feet, a lot of the time people tense their feet so much because of stresses in the mind. You know, you, you have these stresses in your body. So in particular, they stress, their, they stress their feet. And that was a big thing that was coming in all the time. So it was a lot of talking and a lot of kind of, uh, although the treatment I'm, I'm doing, that, that's what was one treatment, but also analyzing and asking them about what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. that, cr that creates these different stresses that was going on in the body. And so I found that I was drawn more so to that. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to take that further and understand more. And I went into like, you know, as I loved uh, researching and learning, learning for me is I just want to, I just want to continue learning about myself and, and others and particularly about the human experience and, and how we can um, grow and develop and progress. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, w I went into that path of, of reading all these different kinds of books from, from, um, you know, emotional intelligence book by Goldman and, and, uh, and many more. And, uh, and the brain that changes itself by Norman Dodge and all these other people. And so I uh, wanted to have more of a platform and a more of a, a way for others to be able to listen in on these, on these conversations that, that I, that I was doing with, with different people from all different parts of the world, different fields and so on mm -hmm. and show them in a way too, that you can have, a conversation on a deeper level and you can access your deeper dialogue mm -hmm. and you can also be introspectively analytical. So it's not just about having rehearsed responses. You yeah. know, when you hear these certain topics people bring up and people have rehearsed responses and then they kind of, um, you know, check out. Mm -hmm. So what I want to create is showing you, you can have these deeper conversations. You can almost think out loud because that's what's being introspectively analytical out loud. Mm -hmm. and see that maybe the other person, when you're doing this and having these conversations, maybe the other person has a perspective mm -hmm. that you didn't know about or didn't hear about and you weren't aware of that is um, able to influence what it is you're feeling or, or, or give you another perspective on what it is you're feeling or, or, or experiencing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So as you were speaking about your patients and really getting to know them, um, I actually recently, in fact, I have the book right here. I recently just um, reviewed this book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. Mm. <laughs> and I have used this book for over 15 years because in the back, it has this thing that tells everything that could possibly go wrong with your body. And, it, and, the, and you read and see what resonates with you. So I'm just wondering what happens when we read about the feet. So what you do is you read the things that could be and you see which one you think it stands out and then it makes you aware of what feeling might be causing your feet problem mm. or whatever. So for feet, tell me if this sounds familiar, if you're, any of your patients were maybe in this situation. Fear of the future. Fear of stepping forward in life lack of understanding in many aspects of life do you think any of your patients were dealing with that kind of stuff i think i think they all were <laughs> to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so, and so uh yeah it makes a lot of sense absolutely yeah so i, I just happened to have that book down there because i just reviewed it so but that yeah and it's helped me a lot because i'll go through okay my back's hurting okay it even has upper middle and lower back which one you read so uh, but I think so many times, a lot of what's happening in our lives causes us to have physical issues. Yes. And we're just, when we just become aware of what they are, then a lot of times those actually eliminate or, or even disappear when that happens. Have you found Absolutely. that? Have you ever found just talking to someone helps them? Absolutely. And that was a big, I think a big a key here. Like I had a lot of patients, to be honest, were coming to me just to talk. They wouldn't even actually have a, I'll be honest with you. And they found that I was a good listening ear and that a nice soundboard for them. And I was able to probe them in ways that they could empower themselves. And these people, uh, the, my patients were a lot or much older than me, but mm -hmm. they just didn't have those people around them to be able to do that. So mm -hmm. the treatment itself could be, could take me or could be something very small. Mm -hmm up to 10 minutes but we would sit there and and they would need to and want to talk mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm like okay yeah happy, and happy that's just help. part of the healing right that's, that's <laughs> it that's it exactly that's wild so when i um, when you were talking about um having a conversation with someone and um if people would instead of processing everything and then editing what they're going to say and come out with it if they would just talk out loud, we would understand more of what they're speaking about, or maybe we can understand their perspective as opposed to them trying to agree with you or just not say something. And I know as an introvert, I was always a listener and I did very little talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I only am doing a podcast because I have a mission, I have to talk. But otherwise, I like to listen. Um, and even when I would speak, a lot of times it had been totally thought through before it ever came out of my mouth. Mm. So talk a little bit more about that, about actually saying things out loud without putting our, our foot in our mouth. <laughs> How do we talk out loud and be transparent and actually communicate with people, but just feel, also feel comfortable and safe? That's the key that you just mentioned there, feel comfortable and safe. So I think that's probably what I'm able to do when it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation in this kind of setting. I think a lot of people are feeling safe to be able to think out loud mm -hmm. and um, be able to dive deep into a question or a kind of a conversation. So I guess when I make, when I do go into conversation, I like to make it clear. It's like, you know, you don't need to have knowledge, all this knowledge about something. I want to see where we will go with it. Let's just see where our thinking will take us. But what is clearly required, and I think a lot of people are unable to do it, and hence why they, they can't do this introspective analysis and think out loud, is because they're not actually actively listening. Mm -hmm. So if they hear the skims of a topic and they're like, okay, this is a topic of this of conversation, I'm going to check out now. And when it comes to me saying something, I already know what I'm going to say. And that's not really a conversation. That's, that's not, not conversation. really communication. Communication no. is me saying something, you receiving it, acknowledge it, 
you say something, I receive it, acknowledge it, and we're actually listening, listening so we can understand. But yeah, just having a conversation for entertainment purposes, if you will, or to just be able to say whatever you feel like sharing yeah. is not really communication. No, they're not, they're not conversing. It's not a conversation. It's just like everybody's like they, you could almost put everybody together, but then remove them from that group setting and put them separately and they, they will be saying the same things. Uh -huh. So it's not really, you're not conversing with the people that you're with in that setting, either in a group or on in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I, I, I see a lot of our issues nowadays especially with my generation and younger and a bit older are the problems with dating and relationships people are having a lot of trouble and a lot of that has to do with our, our new way of 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 meeting people through an application mm -hmm. through these apps that people are doing but people aren't really conversing in a way that is on a deeper level through these applications so it's at a lot of studies i've seen a study that was showing that the more we are communicating on a superficial level and texting is considered a superficial level we're not giving any depths with that mm -hmm. the less we're going to recognize that there is a deeper level and so what we will consider as deep connection will no longer exist mm -hmm. yes yeah so that's the scary aspect of that for the for these you know younger generations yeah and, and i find that even now that we're on zoom so much i mean we're across the world so obviously we have to be on zoom but um you know not being able to be in the room with someone and see their body language and feel their energy because you know there's maybe only a little bit of importance in the words the words are important but i think that's only 20 percent. i think 80 percent is what we're feeling, what we're sensing, what we're seeing the person, how they move. I mean, I just watched the debates with um, President Trump and Vice President Biden here in the United States. And President Trump does this little thing with his shoulders when he talks, you know, and Biden's just kind of still, you know, but it says something, the way you move your body, the way you move it when you talk, the, um, and, and just the way and even your intonation sometimes those things can be to totally missed on a zoom or a phone and you're definitely not getting any of it in a text or an email you're absolutely right and it's actually not even 20 percent; it's only seven percent so seven really? percent of your rapport is actually with words like the rest of it, a lot of it is actually more body language and your tone of voice. And that's how you actually build a stronger rapport with someone. So you're absolutely right. Being in the physical presence of somebody, maybe I've had experiences where words and doing zoom calls and it works really, really great. But then when I see the person in the physical, I'm like, wait, we don't actually have much of a connection here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with body language and rapport and the way they either the, how their body is kind of is it directed at you is it away from you is it are, are you you know unconsciously mimicking behavior of mm -hmm. your of your body and your actions and your reactions that's where that's how people subconsciously feel connected more connected to you yeah yeah there is something to be said to just be in the the same room actually the the person that i'm in a relationship with now um so i had broken up with a boyfriend looking for a new boyfriend and I went in those apps for a short time and I'm like, Oh no, I can't do this. Cause people say it's unbelievable what people say or do. Mm. So I'm like, I'm getting off that. So I said, I'm going to just go out and they had this singles um, group. So I went and they had this dance, this gold band dance where they play seventies music and the guy has, you know, the, the Afro it's so cool. But anyways, so you go there and, everybody dances with everybody. It's all mixed. And, um, I, this one guy asked me to dance, which was him. And as soon as I was next to him, I felt like, you know, like mm. you feel that electric, like just pulling you. I didn't know him. I didn't know his name. You know, I just, he just asked me to dance, but I felt immediately that connection, that energy connection. So there was some place there. We were on the same frequency or whatever but yes. 
uh, I had said to myself, because I have always been very international in the people I've been in relationships with, I I'm done with that. You know, it's just always some cultural thing. I'm not doing that. And, <laughs> and so when I was on the app, I would only pick see people that look like me. Mm. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and guess, guess what? This gentleman what? is Asian. <laughs> 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 so now I'm in a very wonderful relationship with an Asian man. But that wouldn't have happened on an app. Nice. Because I would swipe the wrong way because he didn't have a white face. And I'm, and I'm not racial or whatever at all. Like I said, I've had, an, my first husband was from Japan. My second husband was from Mexico. So I have no problem with different races, but I was just like, there's, there's always that extra step when you're in a different culture from someone else. Maybe you can understand that coming, you know, parents being from Egypt and Australia and now in Spain, when you're coming from different um, families, different cultures or diff different ways of being, there's all that miscommunication that can happen. And it, I'll tell you, being in it, <laughs> that it does happen. Sometimes you say something and you really mean well and you're being positive and they take it the wrong way. And it's just because they misunderstood based on the words or the way they were raised or their, um, what they think is okay for men and women, what's okay in public what's not okay in public what's okay in private i mean there's so many things absolutely and it's funny you mentioned that i actually did a, a podcast recently with somebody and talking about how the um, cultural differences can um, impact a relationship and even like you know like you said different you take things differently and what's considered a big thing was what was considered normal in one culture is not considered normal in another so everybody's what normal is different yeah. so that's a big thing and it does influence and it does make you know you would think that it's easier to be with somebody from from your own culture and a lot of people do and in many ways it is easier but then what i was analyzing from that myself on my cafe episodes that i do was this my own little theory about something that i sometimes we think if we're from the same culture that that person could understand us on a deeper level. But what I find is that maybe at the core level, you could be better understood with someone from your same culture, mm -hmm. but they will not be able to get through the layers of you. Mm. And that's what makes say possibility and opportunity to connect with people from different cultures. Mm -hmm because they're able to go through, if there's a strong, deeper connection, like the connection that you, you just mentioned to me, that you, there was a strong draw, that person will, will want to understand and go through and understand the layers that make up, that make up you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is true. That is true. And um, I, for one, really crave deep relationships. Um, I, I sometimes when I'm out in the world, I, I wonder if other people do because I really have not much interest in talking about the weather or even talking much about politics. And right now it's, I definitely don't want to talk about politics because people are so angry about it. Um, but I do want to find out how you're feeling about something, how you're experiencing something. Um, I want to do meaningful things in, and meaningful can be something simple like, I mean, doing yard work together. I don't care. Doing activities together where you're connecting with that person and you're just having a conversation where it's relaxing and you can actually ask those deeper questions. Absolutely. And that's key. And that's what people I think forget too, is like the ultimate thing us human beings need, crave, want, desire is human connection. That's why we want love. What, why do we want love for? Because there's that deep, solid, you know, there's that deeper level connection because somebody wants to know more about us. Somebody wants to go in that deeper place. That's mm -hmm. why we crave it so much because we want connection. We want that deep, we want that deep connection. And until people recognize that that is our most basic need mm -hmm. and want to understand those around them and develop their connections 
you know, we're not really able to, you know, better the whole human experience. I was having a bit of a conversation with a friend the other day. It's like, is it possible? Why is it possible for somebody who prefers superficial conversation and superficial relationships to still rem to be a deep person, to still be able to, I guess, maybe dive deep within themselves? Mm -hmm. Are they still able to be healthy mm -hmm. in the world? And I was going through this, uh, again, that was another episode that I went, went on, um, that I, I, I did on my, my podcast uh, with a clinical psychologist. And she was reading me some, mentioning some of these science and, and different journal articles. And it, it, you won't, for a period of time, what would be the research was showing, for a period of time, for it to work, you could remain healthy for a short period of time, but then it catches up to you. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and then it, it goes beyond your control of that's what you truly desire and need to function in a healthy, optimal way. Exactly. So what about the, um, there's people that they really don't prefer conversation most of the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, yes. you know, uh, you, you say, let's talk about this. Nope. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about anything. No, so they're always no. guessing what is it that they want you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I like have this thing. Well, I think a lot of people don't know how. They don't know how. So they've never grown up with it or they've never been, you know, met friends who do that with them or they've never been put in situations where that was done in a healthy way. So it's avoided. Mm -hmm. And so, and all they don't know how because they've never seen it done before. They've never been in those kinds of settings and environments. So I think, you know, part of if you do know how, like opening up a conversation and going on it, I would say it's better to do it one-on-one -on -one because you'll be able to get somewhere and show that person and they will go back and go, hey, I really enjoyed that. I want to do it again. And subconsciously, they'll seek it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And um, doing what I do, um, I love asking questions, but even before I did a podcast, I am... I'm especially good at asking questions because I've been curious and mm -hmm. I'm truly intensely interested in people um, and one to know, you know, about them and what makes them happy and, and I want to know about their work or their hobbies or whatever. So it's, it's easy, I think, to start a conversation by just asking people questions. Now, sometimes people are still going to not answer them. They're like, not going there, but I think that's a, a way to start a conversation. Yes, absolutely. You need to ask questions. You want to know somebody, or if you want them to know you, ask a question. Mm -hmm. You could even, and it doesn't need to mean, it doesn't mean you need to have a, like a, a whole list of things in your mind. You could even just have two questions or even one question, because one question you could talk for hours about one question, because it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And you realize more and more and more. And hence why my podcast is based around one question, mm -hmm. but yet you go deeper in it and it kind of goes, ha, huh. in the start of the conversation, maybe you thought this about the question or you had that one response, but then going deeper into it, it highlights something different to you and you reflect about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And That's you're cool. able to still, yeah. So it's not even knowing, needing to know many questions. It's just ask one question, but have what you have, which is great, a curiosity to know more. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think um, even the shyest person wants someone to acknowledge them or notice them or, you know, even if they're really super shy, you know, just saying anything uh, helps people feel good about themselves because no one wants to be an island. I don't care how introverted you are. No one really wants to be an island. No. No, everyone on ever on any level of personality trait or type needs connection needs needs to be social at some point in time it's not they don't retreat for big chunks of time and then come back out it's not like that mm -hmm. it's more of a weekly thing not necessarily a yearly thing or, or a monthly thing so have you ever come across this um i've been in relationship with with friends in the past where they start talking 
and they talk about one subject and they don't let you say anything and they and then they don't even take a breath and they go to the next subject and they go to the next subject and they've talked about four or five like basic you know subjects but like expanded on them and 20 minutes later they say so what do you think and i think about what do you what i think what i think about which thing you were talking about i mean you know those people that they just like almost throwing up their words at you and and um being a person who listens i mean i'm good about listening but everybody's attention span still needs a little break every 12 seconds or 30 seconds or something so if you're in that situation where someone is doing that and you actually want to have a deep conversation because that's not a deep conversation they're in their own head just spewing out their words and and the other person sitting there going, I wish they would finish. I want to leave. Let me out of the room. <laughs> so uh, let's say okay. you're that person wanting to get out of the room. How do we actually do that? break that cycle so we can actually have a conversation? Sure. So there's a number of things. It really depends on, is this person a good close friend of mine? So I'm curious if this person was, a close, have you ever tried, Kimberly, to say, hey, if it's a, if it's a close friend of yours, say, hey, um, you know, this is what you do in, in a, com in a, in how you express yourself. You jump from topic to topic mm. or, you know, for me to get into the conversation, could you create a space for me to be able to enter and tell me, tell you my thoughts about this, this topic? Cause we're conversing. Have you ever thought about just taking your friend aside and, and saying something like that? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, it was actually when I was quite young that I had this friend. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like so 20. yeah, I was like 20 and I just, yeah. Are you going to stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th those, those situations are quite hard. So I would say like, if you are a close friend and you have someone like that in your life now, I would mention, you know, to them, like, I want to enter the conversation. What is the best way for you where you don't consider it rude for me to enter the conversation with you? Mm -hmm. I know that is quite difficult and most people won't do that. But there are other ways also. What I find is in situations like this with people that I'm not, or I don't have solid um, uh, or deeper or closer friendships with, I would either have a, an expression. If you're an expressive person, sometimes you make a face mm -hmm. and they think you're thinking the opposite of what they're thinking. Like, oh, wait, you've got, you want to say something because uh -huh. of your facial expression, uh -huh, okay. right? Or you make a sound. You go, like, huh, or uh, huh. And just that hmm sound is like, wait, you've got something to say. You don't agree with me. Uh -huh. And so they'll, they'll stop again. Okay. Now, what, what is what I find too, it really changes and it really depends on cultures. Some cultures will talk on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be okay. I don't know, in the Egyptian culture, people talk like this. In oh. the Spanish culture, people talk like this in group settings. So yeah. I do find it quite tricky in a group situation for me to enter the conversation. And I tend not to because I don't want to. I know it's not rude in this culture, but I still consider it rude. And I would, it's difficult for me to you know, talk over someone for me to enter a conversation. I just don't want to do that. And so I stick with, I'll be in the group, but I'll, I'll direct it to one person something mm -hmm. that I might have to say. Another thing, and when I do want to say something in the group, in the group situation, I will put my hand up. I know this is what we did at school, mm -hmm. but you know, among 30 year olds and things, oh, my hand will be up. And they'll be like, Tiff, Tiff, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, uh, I want to say doing? something, but uh, you're all talking on top of each other and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so when you notice that I'm, you know, whenever I'm stopped, <laughs> waving like you're out on a sail, on a boat. Exactly. Hello. Exactly. <laughs> exactly and then and then they eventually turn around and be like yeah if you want to say something i'm like yeah i do want to say something <laughs> so, and that is the, a way of entering a conversation in, in some of those settings and some of those times but in most cases they're not i think usually these people that if you if your relationships aren't solid or you're not close with these people then it's something like well i'm not going to see them again so it's that you don't tend to think about how you can enter a conversation but mm -hmm. when it is in a group setting and or maybe you're, you're doing a, a a sport or something and people are talking on top of each other then i think and you're doing it on a regular weekly basis then i think you take some of these different ways of, of entering the conversation and again if it's somebody close that you know a good close friend i would have a conversation about them not having letting you in in the conversation <laughs> <laughs> basically <laughs> For sure. And I also noticed differences in communication between men and women. So a friend of mine was telling me she was in a boardroom where she was 
the superior um, mm -hmm. uh, person as far as rank. And uh, there was mostly men and she, and I think she might've been the only woman and she and the man started talking at the same time at this conference table and she stopped and let him talk because he kept talking. So he kept, he was going to keep talking no matter what. She, she was coming in by saying, excuse me, and was going to say something. Now she's saying, excuse me, he's starting his, what he wants to say, like, totally ignoring her and just continuing with what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So the next time she wanted to say something, what did she do? She didn't say, excuse me. She just started talking just like the guys. So how do we you know, men and women should be able to communicate with each other without, I know men sometimes want to do this one up mission. I don't know what they call it, this competition <laughs> where women are, you know, we want to share or get everybody together. So how do we enter those conversations where um, maybe we're the only woman or sometimes the only man? Because I bet if men were in that situation where it was all women and they were the only one at the table, they might feel the same way too. So how do we do that? Absolutely. That's a really great question. So I find obviously those settings usually are in professional settings. So yes. like you're talking about, it's career related. Okay. So I think in some way or form that in that kind of setting, in many ways, it's kind of easier because you, it's always professional. Mm -hmm. So either before or after these meetings, and in your friend's situation, she was a superior, you know, there's always moments or, okay, what we're going to do in these meetings is create a time, uh, a space for everybody to say what they need to say. And so, okay, this time right now is for you. And then when you finish speaking, it's somebody else's turn. I think in those professional settings, these things need to be put in place. Mm -hmm. For, for everybody to be able to voice their opinions or their perspective or their analysis or what they need to say. And it's so much easier because it's all done professionally mm -hmm. than in a, in a setting of like a casual or a dating setting or uh, in those kinds of spaces or even a family setting. It's still easier than in a family setting because then mm -hmm. it kind of gets a bit heavier and people, people are more comfortable expressing themselves in maybe not so uh, polite fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, not so formal. <laughs> exactly. But that's a great idea because, um, you know, I know it's just as far as business, so many times the people who are in higher positions, they don't know what the people who are below them, what their ideas are. And a lot of times the best ideas come from those people, but they are afraid to speak or they don't feel like they have the right to speak. So if you did that round table type of thing, you could get all the ideas, especially if the person at the head of the table would not speak at first, not tell them because otherwise everybody's going to agree with, with that person, right? Because they don't want to lose their job. But if you have everybody speaking around the table and then that person speaking, I think that would be helpful and, you know, promote their business and everything. Exactly. I did. A, I did. A, a friend of mine. Um, she's a CEO of this uh, company called Masami. She, uh, Lynn Power. She's lovely, and she's. Um, I really, really admire her and the way she's able to be uh, vulnerable. And what she find and what we were discussing was that vulnerability, especially in leadership, it really opens. Uh, um, innovation and trust and creativity in businesses. So people are more comfortable in opening up. So if you're a leader and you're able to be vulnerable with people that are working in your company uh, in, in ways of, and, and I know people think vulnerable, I'm not saying emotional, I'm saying vulnerable, mm -hmm. two different things. So being able to share and say, hey, maybe I made a mistake in, in, in deciding this decision for the company. Uh, how can we as a team uh, make this better or come up with a solution? And even just saying something as simple as that and just owning up to it as a leader is, you know, being vulnerable in that setting allows people to want to get involved for, for, for them to come up with ideas and share what, what they have to say. Another thing that Lynn was also mentioning is that uh, what she finds too is that people who are a bit more reserved in a meetings in such, she will direct the conversation and say, hey, uh, Amber or what, whoever the name is, um, mm -hmm. You know, do you have something you'd like to add to the conversation? Mm -hmm. 
And that's and, a great that's idea because sometimes in those settings and, and even in uh, settings where there's friends together, you know, there's always that one person or two people that they constantly talk and take over the conversation and no one else gets to talk. So you never hear, hear anyone else's ideas. So yeah, yeah, if you actually ask that person, because all of a sudden they feel, I, I can tell you from being uh, shy as a young person, all of a sudden you're given permission to speak. Not that you need permission, but in other words, the floor is mine now. Okay. Once the floor is mine, I, I'm all, I'm ready to talk, Exactly. but I won't go and take over the floor. No. And that's a personality trait. That's right. a personality type. And that, that, like yourself, a lot of people, introverted people will not take over the floor and uh, just butt in. Because the extroverts, a lot of the time, as you're mentioning that in your friend situation, like to dominate the conversation and, and be loud and, 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 and do that. Um, where other people are, maybe they do need time to think about something that's being said in the media before they come up with uh or they analyze it or, and come up with their own solutions of what they do have to say, but mm -hmm. then they do have something to say. So they should be given the floor. And I think by directing it to them, mm -hmm. um, or if you direct it to them too, because I know some people on that introverted scale would like to have something to say, but not share it in a meeting kind of setting. Mm -hmm. would, would rather send an email or talk to uh, the, the CEO of the company one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Mm -hmm and see what fits and works best, I think, for each person. Exactly. So when we're at work, we really can't choose who we're around most of the time. We're just who no. was ever at work. But in our personal spaces, in our personal time, how important is it to choose the right people to be around us? It is extremely important. Now, this is a big thing that I love to talk a lot about with friends of mine even and make it clear and, and explain to them what's going on. Now, there's two things that really happen here. So something that people don't know is that we have these things called mirror neurons. These mirror neurons, and it really is a mirror. A mirror neurons will take basically whatever anybody that we're spending a lot of time with, we're going to take on their thinking and their behavior. And you see it happening. Like I'm sure you've said it, seen it yourself. But one of my friends, he uh, likes to say, like he says this a lot, where he says something and then he goes, in any case, in any case, and he's, that's always on the tip of his tongue. Mm -hmm. And now the more time I was spending with him, I started doing the same. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can automatically, yeah. exactly. And even behaviors and actions, like a friend of mine that may always, when he's thinking, he might always like touch his chin or do this. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm spending a lot of time with him, I end up doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So these are why we, why we do this is because of these mirror neurons. So it's not just based on actions, but also thoughts, things people say and mm -hmm. the way people think. So that's why I think it's important to be around different people, different types of people and thinking of people so you mm -hmm. can see, so you can take on and, and experience these different perspectives because otherwise you're around this one type of thinking, you take on their thinking, they take on yours, it kind of meshes into some kind of mixture of those two things. And you don't know, like, were these, were these my, my own ideas? Or is this what I truly believe? This is my perspective or is it because I spent a lot of time with this person I'm taking on their beliefs and their perspectives about something. So that's, that's why, that's why they say, you know, you're made up of the five people you mostly surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. And that kind of shifts into this other thing of, you know, although you are made up of those five people, you also take on energies mm -hmm. as well of these people. So what, what uh, is really important. So you obviously are vibrating us humans. We're all vibrating at a frequency. Your body parts are vibrating at a frequency. And this is like something physically that you can measure. Mm -hmm. And your emotions vibrate at frequencies. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at, so say you're very peaceful, you're content, you're grateful in this point in time, that's a higher frequency. If you're depressed, you're jealous, you're resentful, that's a lower frequency. Mm -hmm. Now you pick up these things again from the people that you're around. So you've, you're vibrating yourself at something, your frequency will change based on who you're surrounding yourself with. Mm -hmm. So say you're at a higher frequency, you're peaceful, you're content, but then you're around five people who are all in the jealous, resentful kind of frequency, you're going to drop down to their level. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You're I not mean, going to be able to live. I mean, up. even with family members, you know, you can have had a great day, all happy, you come home, and someone's upset about something. <laughs> and all yeah. of a sudden, it's like you, you can almost come down to their level so you can actually communicate with them. Because from up here, when you're all happy and they're all upset, uh, even if you want to communicate communicate with them, you really can't. You almost have to come down and start speaking at this level and kind of bring them up. <laughs> and and the, the hard part is bringing them up. So if you come down to their level, depends on how much they've brought you down. It's actually hard almost to come back up. That's why if it's, you know, unless it's one person who's at that lower level, but yet they're around a lot of people who are at a higher level, then mm. it's easy to bring up. But if you're the person who's at a higher level going into a group of, of people who are at a lower level, they're going to bring you down. You're not going to bring them back up. Yeah, it's really and hard. And you won't, be, it's very, it's a lot harder. And it, even, even too, when it comes to just television. So remember too, the objects and things around you are also vibrating at frequencies. So if you're watching a television, the television is vibrating at a frequency and it's constant. Plus what's coming out of the television, if it's negative news, negative, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, it vibrates again, it goes even lower. And again, it can remain constant because it's a machine. Mm -hmm. You, you will be altered. You, you have a, 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 your frequency in that spectrum. You'll be able to drop and shift from that. So the more you sit in front of the television, listening, listening in to negative news, what's going on, all the bad that's going on around the world, mm -hmm. you're going to drop down and stay down at that level. Yeah, and, and I agree. And I see that, especially with all the, you know, stuff that's been be putting out in the media right now, there's even more than normal negative news and you see it because when I'm out in the public, because I'm, you know, still out seeing patients and, you know, a lot of people are afraid and, and, and they're afraid because they're listening to the TV too much. And um, I, I noticed that really early on. So, I, gosh, I, I, I stopped having television over 20 years ago. <laughs> I haven't had television in my house. Sometimes we'll watch a movie, but we don't have the, the television on because I, there's so, I think there's a lot more negative on it. I mean, not just the news, but even some of the shows, I, it's like, I don't want to watch that. I don't, I especially don't want to watch it before I go to sleep and dream about it. Absolutely, absolutely. And even in like retirement homes too, they just let the, the elderly watch this negative news, which is detrimentally affecting their health and they're deteriorating even quicker mm -hmm. and which people don't realize. And I, I admire that you haven't watched television in 20 years. I've done it now for the last like six or seven years. I won't watch mm -hmm. just television and things. It doesn't mean people think, oh, that means you're not in tune with what's going on in the world. No, it doesn't. You all can read. You can read newspaper articles. You can read different things. What's yeah, going on. So right. you want to know what's going on. You can find articles about it and you can kind of have control over how it's, how, what you take from it as well. And how you're not hearing when you're hearing negative things, it's more mm -hmm. detrimental to your emotions than you reading it. Exactly. And also I think when you're reading, you can research it and look for facts. You're not listening to all the hype. Yes. So, um, you know, the, the boyfriend I'm with now, he likes to look at what's going on politically and everything every day and what's happening in the world. But he goes on certain sites that he trusts, you know, um, like uh, BitChute. We have something called BitChute, which is an alternative to like YouTube because mm -hmm. that's not censored. Nothing censored mm -hmm. there. Like in the, the general media, it's censored. And it's yes. used to manipulate people where these other sites that are not censored, I mean, you'll get all sorts of things, but you can still choose which things you want to look at to see what facts, what the real facts are. Because based on facts, you don't have to be emotional about them. They're just facts. Mm -hmm. but the media is coming out and grabbing people's emotions and scaring them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great point you point out there. People are just taking whatever they hear and taking it as biblical. And that's not true. So like you need to do your research, go and read. I know it's time consuming. It's like, I don't want to read, but then don't believe then everything you hear from the media. Like you, it's the media's job to keep us at this negative energy level. They don't want us to be at a higher positive energy mm -hmm. frequency. Cause then with the, when you're at a high frequency, you're more content. You, you, you're not, you're not able to be controlled. Right. 
exactly. when you're at a lower frequency, you are. So it works in their favor to keep us all at this lower frequency. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the opposite of what I'm going for. I'm going yeah. for freedom and self-actualization. Is that how you say it? Self-actualization yes. and being my best self and just contributing to the world and inspiring people to do the same thing. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic, Kimberly. So, yeah. Yeah. And the TV doesn't help with that at no, all. Not, no, it does not. <laughs> So what gives you the most joy in your life? What gives me the most, most joy is connection, a meaningful goal. We've all just spoken all about this, mm -hmm. but I'm doing something. And at the moment, my podcast doesn't make me any money at all, mm -hmm. but I have been the happiest I have ever been mm -hmm. by having meaningful conversation and connecting with others. And it, it has enhanced myself and my knowing like meaningful conversation allows you to learn about yourself. So the more you learn and there's studies that show this, the more you get to know yourself, the more self-worth you have. Mm -hmm. it, they correlate with each other. And so my connections are stronger, my, and they're getting deeper with friends and family and new people that I'm meeting like yourself. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that brings me the most joy. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we've mentioned your podcast many times today. Um, I would like people to know how can they contact you? How can they hear your podcast? What's the name of it? What's the best way to get to know you? So, well, it's funny you should say that because my podcast is called Get to Know You with Tiffany Farrak. So we open conversations and we access deeper dialogue and it's set around the question. So you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and any major podcast platform uh, you can we also have an instagram and a facebook page it's called at get to know you with tiffany farag and i think you'll probably put a tag there with the, so they know the name of, of that and uh we're also um you're also able to send in which is something that unique about my podcast is we have cafe episodes these cafes means you as listeners send in your perspectives about the tuesday discussions so you get to be part of the conversation too so it's a podcast that just doesn't tell you my perspective or my guest speaker's perspective but it gives you a platform to involve yourself and add your perspective and that's what we're going to do let's hear the more perspectives it's a global podcast too so it's around the world you hear perspectives from different cultures religions races sexualities orientation all genders people from all over the world and um, allow yourself to have clarity about a certain topic or what you think about certain things um, that impact your own thinking and behavior mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you. I have this has loved been our crazy. conversation. Me and, too. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. So I have one last question for you. What is your best advice for living an incredible, amazing life? My best advice, my best advice to live an incredible life, I would have to say is be someone who's able to be attentive and present with every interaction that you have because you're going to get so much more out of that and i think that adds to living a fulfilled life beautiful well thank you so much tiffany thank you kimberly this has been amazing thank you so much for having me on yes we'll talk to you again soon talk soon <laughs>